Okay, this video is going to be, it started out with the idea of making a book review of this thing called Pax Britannica and by Jan Morris. And basically, I thought the book sucked. So why am I making a review of it? Because I'm not going to talk about that book too much. What I did want to talk about, and I don't really have another context for it, so I'll just do it here. I'm going to talk about the Victorian Renaissance with regard to what was primarily Catholic, okay? Um, a lot of people, very few people know about this, but it's, it's good to know about. So here's Queen Victoria. Here's Prince Albert. They had nine children. She lived a very long life from 1819 to 1901. And that was the Victorian age in England. It was the richest country in the world, had the greatest empire. The sun never set on the Victorian empire. Okay, and like I said, the book, this Pax Britannica book was lame. Uh, but there's some very interesting things that came out of Victorian England. So first of all, you know, my father's Irish, and as you probably know if you've seen my videos before, I, I don't like, you know, the, the British basically had the Irish almost in slavery for about a thousand years, okay? It was terrible what they did. They're still doing some bad things to the Irish, okay? So th that's contemptible. And, you know, basically they're more powerful than Ireland. They're a much bigger country, so they just declare the Irish as inferior and they abuse them for a thousand years. That's what basically happened. But what I want to talk about is some of the, there were some good things that happened in Victorian England. You know, the literature, we're, I'll show you the painting first. We'll start with the art. I'm going to show you some stuff that you're going to think, I think if you care at all about art or Christianity or culture and literature, you're, you're going to be interested in these things. So first of all, John Ruskin. John Ruskin is like the center of the Victorian age with regard to art in particular, but also architecture. He was a crazy genius, sort of of a, you know, Calvinist, Scottish origins growing up in England and, you know, Bible-thumping parents. And his father was rich. He took him to travel around the world. So he had seen a lot, okay? And he was very good at drawing himself. He was a big proponent of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a group of artists who went back to a style they considered from before Raphael. In his opinion, Raphael had put the you know Mount Parnassus of the poets in the stanza signatura of the Vatican at the same height as the disputa sacrament of the communion. The point being was he felt that Raphael had changed art from being devout and religious to something more aesthetic without a strong religious tone and Ruskin felt that was a big step back. And the things that are funny about him is that he loved art and so even though he was in a sense a Protestant he couldn't help admiring the Catholic art, but he would criticize it even though he knew it was great. So it ends up being kind of funny. John Everett Millay was the best of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood artists. So we're going to see some more paintings of him in just a moment. Uh, Ruskin had great speech. He has the greatest speech ever of all time by an art critic. Uh, the 1853 speech on the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. I like this painting just because it's fun. There's Oscar Wilde, and I like Oscar Wilde because he was an Irish writer, and he goes to England, and everybody hates him, but he becomes the best writer, the best playwright, the most popular writer in England. You know, he destroyed his life. He converted to Catholicism a little later, um, and he kind of ruined his own life, and he was a little bit of a screw-up alcoholic loser at the end, but I still admire the guy for the things that he did, and his quotes are great. I I've read, like, five biographies of him. Um, Okay, so what are some of the things I admired about them? They had a very strong sense of this return to, you know, painting the traditions of King Arthur and the knights and chivalry. And some of this really comes out of Ireland once again. You know, the story of Finn McCool and the Fenians, okay? That was sort of part of what led up to the stories of King Arthur, okay? It wasn't just something from England, uh, but it includes Welsh traditions. It also includes uh, the Irish traditions, okay? Finn McCool and the Fenians, Celtic Ireland, Okay, um, so of course, here's the romantic story of Tristan and Isolde, and that was partly why the whole King Arthur uh, stories became so popular, because there's a lot of romance involved in them, okay? So look at these magnificent paintings. This guy, Edmund Layton, is a magnificent artist, and he's one of the late um, students of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. You know, John William Waterhouse, also a fantastic artist. So the Pre-Raphaelite uh, Brotherhood of Artists inspired all this great art, and it largely was focused around the themes of chivalry. Um, this is from the medieval days of Abelard and Eloy, is the most famous uh, romantic Christian couple of the Middle Ages. It's an extraordinary story. We're not going to go into it right now. Romeo and Juliet. And just look how beautiful this is. I mean, it's extraordinary. There's nothing like this, you know, the last century, okay? Uh, Lady Godiva, you know, she, to, she was a friend of the people, of the peasants, and to protest her 
uh, husband raising the her king husband raising the taxes of high. She rode bareback through town, and again, just look at the quality of the art. And then, of course, you know the big romance was uh, Queen Guinevere, uh, King Arthur's wife, and uh, Lancelot, and that's a whole bunch of other stories. Perhaps that came more out of the French. We're not going to get into that. Uh, tremendous respect for Christianity and religion and the saints. This is uh, Saint Elizabeth, who, despite being born rich, the daughter of a king, she dedicated her life to helping the poor uh, and actually joined the secular order of the Franciscans. But what I'm trying to say is there's this tremendous Christian appreciation for God and, and in, in this art. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> there's a lot of bad stuff about the 1800s, and some of my Irish friends will say, how the hell could I say anything good about England? And I'm going to say that you know, they were, in terms of their secular component, the English were evil in the 1800s and what they did to the Irish in the famine in the 1840s, okay? But the component of some of their art was good and I think it's worth looking at. Okay, so here's the Hamlet play. This is by Edward, Edwin Austin Abbey, you know, Hamlet looking back at the king. There's his Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. There's Ophelia. And then here's a painting by John Everett Millay, you know, the great Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood painter. And just look at this painting of Ophelia. And I realize it's a very sad subject, okay, when she went crazy uh, after Hamlet sort of broke up with her out of his, his own craziness. But look how magnificent this painting is, okay? Um, John Everett Millay had the famous lady model actress of the time posing in a bathtub. And she caught a cold because the burner underneath couldn't heat the water enough. That's another... Big story. But anyways, magnificent painting of Ophelia from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Okay, and then again, there's a lot of fun to be had with the whole story of King Arthur and the knights. And here's uh, Lancelot, who was a little bit mischievous. That's why Lancelot didn't get to go find the Holy Grail, because his mischief with Guinevere. Uh, but he was the greatest fighter of the knights. Okay, and then here was the funny scene. You might remember they did a spoof on this in um, the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. This is Sir Galahad. Sir Galahad the good, the noble, uh, the saintly. And he ended up in a castle full of maidens and he had to control himself from the temptation. Okay, um, Galahad the good, he had to be noble and pure in order to have the, the right that he would be entitled to go find the grail. So, you know, there's a lot of fun, all these stories. Okay, and you get a sense, too, of the seriousness of life in the Middle Ages and the days of chivalry. You know, the young prince is displayed before the crowd. Later on, the prince is getting married, and, you know, the men-at-arms come to tell him, no, nope, I call the arms. So instead of having a wonderful honeymoon, he's got to go do all that other stuff. But there's a very masculine, brave, protective chivalry. And I heard a nice quote recently. It said, is toxic masculinity the problem or is a lack of masculinity the problem in the modern world? Uh, I think it's more of this. Uh, so anyways, the Vigil. So the brave knight, you know, it's very Christian, very honorable, dedicated. So I like all that stuff. Uh, here's another beautiful painting. Look at this, called The Shadow, where she's tracing the shadow of her lover, her husband, on the on the wall there. You can see the ship is waiting to take him away. He has to go to fight to defend his country. And it's incredibly sad. And if you ever had a long distance relationship, you know what these goodbyes are like. They are so sad. You never forget them. Um, I remember that song, like, leaving on a jet plane. Okay, anyways, she traces the outline. That's by Edmund Layton, the great uh, pre-Raphaelite um, brotherhood artist. And I like this, a sense of respect for God. So the two crowns. So the king, on the one hand, he's the big shot. But on the other hand, there's a bigger king than him, and he looks up to that, and he has to respect that, and the people expect him to respect that. That's the best of the two worlds, you know, when they're sort of separate. Religion's a good thing when it's separate from the ruler. Um, it's corrupt when it's... That's one of the things, too. I think Anglicanism, you know, the religion of England, is basically a joke. I mean, it's founded by Henry VIII. He's like, you know, evil, about as evil a ruler as you'll see. You know, what do you do? He had... Six wives, he beheaded about half of them. And then, you know, who was sort of the later ruler? Just about 100 years later, you got Cromwell. Cromwell is one of the most evil rulers that ever lived. You know, he's known as the devil in Ireland. So when the religion is too much controlled by the ruler of a country, it just becomes a tool of the ruler, you know. You know, I was reading some of these books about religion in, in England. They would put the Union Jack flag over the altar. I mean, it's ridiculous. They would put... Uh, persons from their secular society in their 
churches, okay? That's ridiculous, okay? You know, the Protestants talk about don't uh, worship an image, and they're putting their secular rulers in their church, okay? That's ridiculous, all right? So, yeah, and of course, like I said, a church founded by Henry VIII, nothing good can come from that, okay? And that's why the Anglican is partly faded so weak. Don't get me wrong, I know the Catholic Church got lots of problems, but that's a leadership problem. It's not a problem with the religion. It's a problem with the leadership. Okay, so anyways, uh, a little bit about the literature from the 1800s. Charles Dickens wrote the greatest novel ever written, The Christmas Carol. And the best part, you know, was the, the redemption, the turnaround of Scrooge. So here Scrooge has been taken by the third spirit. There was a spirit of Christmas past, a spirit of Christmas present, and this is the spirit of Christmas future who led Scrooge to his grave, his tombstone, his lonely, empty existence. And Scrooge, luckily, made a turnaround. He said, Spirit, clutching the, the robe of the Spirit, Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been before this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future the spirit of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing of this stone. And Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. So I love that. Actually, I love this painting of, of Scrooge with his friend Tiny Tim later on. Otherwise, he would have died. So anyway, it was a beautiful story. The spirit had shown him Tiny Tim dying. So it's a great turn. And I mean, that just echoes in the human heart, the theory, the theme of redemption. That's kind of what Christianity is all about. That's why it produces, uh, it's a big part of why it produces all this magnificent art. There's nothing like Christianity in this world. Anybody below, give me a comment below. Just show me any, any other culture that's produced, you know, anything in the ballpark of the amount of beautiful art that Christianity has produced or the amount of beautiful music. It's incredible for that. It, it, it creates the metaphysics that generate that. And the fact that it creates the metaphysics that generate this shows that this is something magnificent about it. You know, a world without Christianity would be kind of a bleak place. Okay, here's a painting uh, about Christmas Carol, and there's uh, Bob Cratchit, you know, with his son, Tiny Tim. Okay, and so here's G.K. Chesterton. He was another uh, English Catholic writer. The beauty and the real blessing of the book, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, does not lay in the mechanical plot of it, the repentance of Scrooge. It lays in the great happiness that glows through Scrooge and everyone around him. And whether the Christmas visions would or would not convert Scrooge, they convert us. Yeah, it's great. And that's what I think is also funny, too. It's these Catholics and, and things that are imitating Catholics that are producing all this beautiful art and literature, okay? And I also think it's funny. The best writers in England were typically the Irish. They're the best playwrights. And, uh, you know, Oscar Wilde, Bernard Shaw, and some of the other ones. Okay, um, anyways, here's some interesting books. This is a good book about the Catholic literary giants by Joseph Pierce. I like this one quite well. This one about Catholic converts by Patrick Allett. Not as good, but it's still good. This guy, Patrick Allett, though, he did some good things. He made a history of the Victorian age in England, and he is um, an Englishman. His father was a, a pilot in the Royal Air Force of World War II. Um, so I like Patrick Allen. He's a little born. He's a little bit of your typical professor, you know, kind of narrow, but he's... Um, it was still good. His History of Victorian England, I think, was the best one that I've read. I read a couple of them. Um, okay, here's some guys, two Catholic writers that, that came out of the, um, the late Victorian age. The first is Hilaire Bullock. Uh, and these guys were close friends, G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Bullock. They used to joke, used to call them Chester Bullock. So that's G.K. Chesterton, here's Hilaire Bullock. So here's some things Hilaire Bullock had said. Wherever the Catholic sun doth shine, there's always laughter and good red wine. That's characteristic of Catholicism. People having a good time, being happy. Uh, Protestantism is more of a pain in the butt, you know, self-righteous. It kind of comes, look at Lutheranism, okay? Lutheranism, again, was part of a way to take land and property away from the Catholic Church in Germany. So the princes wanted it because they could, you know, take power in their own country rather than have people sending their money out to Rome. Um... Okay, so he now continues, Bullock. It has been discovered that with a dull urban population, all formed under a mechanical system of education, a suggestion or command, however senseless and unreasoned, 
will be obeyed if it is sufficiently repeated. All industrial civilization is clearly moving towards the reestablishment of a servile condition. So Balak could see what was happening. It's kind of sad, but most people are ahistorical, so they can't see that what's happening today, right now, is just a repeat of stuff that's happened in the, in the, in the past. Progressive centralization of power to increase command of all the, the peasants, the proles. Uh, okay, so Hilaire Block saw this all coming, you know, you know, almost 100 years ago, okay? And anybody who's read history, you know, knows anything about what had happened in the past in Russia. It's pretty obvious what the English did to the Irish. It's pretty obvious. Okay, so here's another Catholic writer, G.K. Chesterton. These guys are both from England, but they're Catholics. Balak was sort of English and French, okay? I think he's a little more English than French, uh, but he was a great writer. He wrote, he wrote some good books, too, and he wrote about pilgrimages and stuff to France and uh, to Rome. Okay, anyways, here's uh, Balak. Here's some quotes, by the way, from G.K. Chesterton. It is the test of a good religion that you can make, whether you can make a joke about that. Okay, so that's good. That's one thing that's good about Catholicism. You could joke about it. And okay, don't get me wrong. I think the modern pope stinks. I think he's a phony, like an antichrist. Okay, but you can joke about Catholicism. What's the pope going to do? He's not going to do anything. Okay, and I could care less what he does. All right. So um, G.K. Chesterton continues. It isn't that they can't see the solution. It's that they can't see the problem. And you will never find the solution if you don't see the problem. Okay, so that's a great quote. And that tends to be my experience with most people, a lot of people in the modern world. They don't even know enough to recognize there's a problem. And until you recognize the problem, you can't ever figure out a solution. You know, you need to also, you need to realize there's some websites that are good for information about science, nutrition, and art. There are other websites that are good for information about news. And you have to figure that out. Uh, otherwise, you'll never know one or the other. Okay? And I see that as a common problem. Um you have to study history or you can't understand the present. Okay, here's another quote from G.K. Chesterton. Don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. And then he wrote a great um, poem that became a really famous song. Uh, this is a famous song by Iron Maiden. It's also, there's also a couple other versions of it that are great. You can just type in the first like couple words in, in the front first line and you'll get this song. O God of earth and altar, bow down and hear our cry. Our earthly rulers falter. Our people drift and die. It's an awesome song, Iron Maiden. And plus the other groups, there's other groups of singers, they sing it even better than Iron Maiden does. Okay, trust me, it's an awesome song. It's one of my favorite Christian songs. Okay, uh, G.K. Chesterton continues. The more I considered Christianity, the more I found that while it, estab it established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. I saw the same thing too. I went to both a public school and to a Catholic school. And what I saw at the Catholic school, there was no BS. I mean, don't get me wrong, the teachers were just as stupid and the class lessons were just as stupid. But the big difference was everybody behaved. There was no fighting. There was no drugs. There were nobody having sex. The adults were in charge. Whereas in the public schools, it was like sort of a chaos. Okay, um, People doing drugs, kids getting pregnant in seventh grade. Um, it was kind of a mess. Okay, uh, G.K. Chesterton continues. The problem of disbelieving in God is not that a man ends up believing nothing. It is much worse than that. He ends up believing anything. Okay. G.K. Chesterton continues. The way to love anything is to realize that it may be lost. You know what? And you better love freedom or that is going to be lost very soon. So hopefully we'll be able to hang on to our freedom. Hopefully we'll be able to hang on to our Christianity. There is a big movement afoot to persecute Christians and to get rid of the religion of Christianity and to make the Bible illegal. And if you think that's not true, you're not paying attention to what's going on. So hopefully this uh, freedom and Christianity will continue. You know, a world without Christianity and freedom is a world without art. It's a world of eternal slavery. We don't want that. Okay, here is uh, the Cardinal John Henry Newman. He originally was Protestant, but he converted to Catholicism once he had studied Christianity more. Um, and he eventually became a saint. So Cardinal St. John Henry Newman lived from 1801 to 1890. So here's a quote by him. To be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Yeah, when you study the Christian religions more, Catholicism stays. Even though the, the guys in the Vatican right now are a bunch of jerks and they stink 
And there's a problem with the priesthood because you really should have guys allowed to be married, okay? You're not going to be able to get good priests until you allow guys to get married to be priests. And they don't want to do that because they, they kind of like the way they have it, but it's not good for the religion. So anyways, that's why these churches are, are going out of business because the priests stink. Okay, but the religion is good. Uh, so anyways, the religion itself, the intrinsic aspect of it. So here's a nice quote from John Henry Newman. Turn away from Catholicism, and to whom will you go? It is your only chance of peace and assurance in this turbulent, changing world. In the long run, it will be found that either the Catholic religion is verily and indeed the coming in of the unseen world into this, or that there is nothing real in any of our notions as to whence we come and whither we are going. If you unlearn Catholicism, you will become Protestant, then Unitarian, Deist, Pantheist, and finally, skeptic or atheist in a dreadful but infallible succession. Yeah, the truth of that is that the Protestant churches, they just keep splintering, breaking apart, breaking apart, breaking apart, breaking apart. And they really all ought to get just get along and be nice to each other. Um, it's kind of sad. Everything, you know, thing tends to splinter apart and become weaker and weaker and stupider. Okay, here's a nice poem by John Henry Newman. So again, he is uh, John Henry Newman. Converted to Catholicism, he was the leader of what was called the Tractarian Movement, the Oxford Movement. And basically, more and more uh, persons in England in the 1800s were converting to Catholicism. Because when you really study religion, Catholicism, you know, connects back to Jesus Christu, all right? It just connects to all the past. It's, it's the best version of Christianity. Don't get me wrong, there's things I like about all the different Christian groups, and it all kind of comes down to something similar. And I really don't care that much about protocol and, and the details of the mass. Okay, just to let you know, I don't even go to church, okay, because I don't like the churches. I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of Catholic priests. I think they stink in general, okay. Um, but I know some good ones. My mother knew some good ones, and I know, I know a lot of church history, and there's a lot of good things about it. So anyways, let's hear John Henry Newman's poem. God has created me to do him some definite service. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be a preacher of truth. I like that. That's like a motto to live by. God has created me to do him some definite service. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be a preacher of truth. Okay, and then here's from, uh, actually here's from the poem that he wrote. It's called Lead Kindly Light. And this is a Christian hymn. He said, Lead kindly light amid the encircling doom, gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark. And I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step is enough for me. So that's kind of beautiful. Kind of reminds me of that Irish, that Irish song. Be thou my vision. That's a great one. That's a great Catholic song too. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about architecture. All this stuff goes together. This is sort of what you would call the Victorian Catholic Renaissance. Um, so the Protestant churches, you know, they look okay on the outside, but Protestantism is just kind of stale and bleak. You know, Carl Jung had noticed that too with Lutheranism and the German versions of Protestantism. Catholicism is more connected to, you know, the ancient Greeks. It's more, you know, they... They pray to saints. They don't worship saints, but they pray to saints with the idea that the saint will potentially theoretically intercede and to ask for favor of, uh, of God for you. You know, you're too scared to ask God because if God rejects you, then you feel like you're screwed. Versus if you ask the saint and nothing good happens, you go, well, I'll ask some other saint. Maybe he'll talk to God and God will do me a favor. So this is just Salisbury Cathedral. It's a nice painting. Okay, now here's a guy who I really like. This is Augustus Welby Pugin. And um, Augustus Welby Pugin, he was an English architect who was a Catholic. And he went and, you know, traveled around and studied the cathedrals. And he's like, holy crap. The, the best cathedrals in the world are France. France just is sort of like the origin of the cathedrals. And France is the best, by far the best. I love the French cathedrals, you know, like Chartres, uh, Notre Dame, and the other ones. They're magnificent. Okay, but anyways... He had traveled around and seen the difference between the Catholic cathedrals and the English cathedrals. And he really wanted to bring back Catholicism in terms of architecture. And he was a Catholic, okay? 
Uh, so this was called the Gothic Revival in England. This also led to a lot of the Gothic, you know, like some of the Ivy League campuses being built this way, and some of the universities in um, England also built this way. Pugin was a big leader of that movement. And I call this, again, part of the English Catholic Renaissance in the 1800s. Um, he loved the way the Roman Catholic Church integrated art and sculpture and architecture in their Gothic cathedrals. So here's some of his quotes. Gothic today, Gothic tomorrow, Gothic forever. Gothic is the only appropriate style for the building of a Catholic church. Everything glorious about English churches is Catholic. Everything debased and hideous is Protestant. A Gothic church, a Gothic cathedral is about light and color, beauty and splendor, with soaring lines that lift the human spirit heavenward. The heaven-pointing spire is a beautiful and instructive emblem of a Christian's brightest hopes. Since I was a child, I have prayed for the restoration of the long-lost glory of Catholic England. Okay, and some of the things that I'll tell you this is a Catholic church instead of Protestant is, you know, the amount of uh, stained glass windows and the paintings on the walls. Catholic churches, you know, Catholic cathedrals are beautiful, okay? And this is the only picture I have of one of Pugin's uh, cathedrals. He, he did a whole bunch more, but they're beautiful compared to the Protestant stuff. But one of the advantages the Protestants have is they let the, the preacher get married. So you, you can recruit from a lot wider range of men and you're going to have a lot of better preachers, you know, like... The United States, when it was founded, all these, there was a lot of preachers all competing, and a lot of them were pretty good. Okay, I'm briefly going to talk a little bit about science. And first of all, we'll start with Isaac Newton, because he's sort of the big transition figure uh, in the modernization of science. He's the smartest guy who ever lived. Okay, so here he is in 1665. He just graduated from uh, Oxford, and he went off to La Family Cottage in Woolsthorpe to study. There was a time of plague, and... He felt he would be safe there, and he just had time to think. He pondered gravity. That was called his miracle year, Anno Mirabilis, 1665. Um, and, you know, he sort of clarified the law of gravity, invented calculus, and did a lot of pioneering work in optics and the mechanics for physics, um, thermodynamics, and whatnot. So anyways, here's a couple quotes by Isaac Newton. He who thinks half-heartedly will not believe in God, but he who really thinks has to believe in God. And I'd agree with that. If you really study science and biochemistry like I've done, you know, for many years of my life, I've been a doctor over 30 years, uh, it's too amazing. It's too incredible. It couldn't have happened by accident. We talked about this before. If you went out to the beach and you saw your name written in the sand, you would say an intelligent person wrote that. How else could that have happened? And then you look at the DNA of a human. There's 3.3 billion base pairs. How is 3.3 billion uh, letters going to be put in correct order unless some brilliant mind designed that, okay? That's not going to randomly happen by chance. You know, the old joke is, well, if you had a thousand monkeys in a room with typewriters, they would type Shakespeare. No, they wouldn't. They would defecate on the typewriters. That's already been tried. That's what happened. Okay, so anyways, uh, more quotes from Isaac Newton. I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the Word of God, written by those who are inspired. I study the Bible daily. All my discoveries have been made in an answer to prayer. Atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. Isaac Newton. And so, you know, a lot of times you'll hear some low IQ atheist saying, oh, God is stupid, there is no religion. You know what? The smartest people who ever lived were pretty devout, okay? Isaac Newton, the smartest scientist who ever lived. Johann Sebastian Bach, perhaps the best composer who ever lived. Everything I do is for God. Michelangelo, all my uh, work is out of my trust in God. What I'm trying to say is, you know, the people who did the greatest achievements of any human that ever lived have been very devout religious people, okay? So when some low IQ atheist, you know, criticize them, I'm like, show me what have you done? Where is, where is your art? Where is your science, okay? So, you know, there's a reason to admire these guys because the, their sense of world vision gave them the energy to put together the greatest human achievements of all time, all right? So I admire them. I want to be like them. Okay, so here's a quote by Humphrey Davy. He was a great uh, science, scientist, primarily a chemist who followed in the footsteps of Isaac Newton, and he also wrote poetry. Just here's a sense of his poem. O most magnificent and noble nature, have I not worshipped thee with such a love 
as never mortal man before displayed, adored thee in thy majesty of visible creation, and searched into thy hidden and mysterious ways, as poet, as philosopher, as sage. So this sense of adoration and appreciation, these are characteristics of an inspired man who then is energized to do great things. And now here's Michael Faraday, you know, and I love this guy too. I mean, this guy was really poor, and he was desperately poor. He was happy to get a job in a bookshop, you know, working all day long, uh, helping with the books. And what he would do is in all of his free moments, he would constantly read, and he self-educated himself and became one of the greatest scientists of all time. Um, he did work both with, you know, the early days of electricity and also with uh, chemistry. And Humphrey Davy was a mentor to him. So here's, here's what Michael Faraday will say. The book of nature which we read is written by the hand of God. Okay? And that, that type of attitude inspires you to want to work hard, not just for getting a grade in school or to make five bucks for the day, but to, to discover the work of God, to discover something beautiful, to create something beautiful. And so that's a great thing. That's a, and that's why, the, that's why, you know, I studied all these great achievers in life, um, and that's a very common theme amongst them. A devout sense of God, a sense of mission in their life, that they were put on this earth for a purpose, and that's what gives them like superhuman energy to do magnificent things. And so if you yourself want to be able to achieve more, you want more energy, think that way and it'll energize you, you know, because everybody in life is kind of sad and frustrated and has a lot of problems. But if you at the same time pick a goal in your life and to do something good, it inspires you, it gives you lots of energy and it also brings you some happiness and hope that help compensate for all your sadness and disappointments that are, you know, are inevitable in life. You can't get away from them and you're just, you got to deal with it. You know, so what you say to yourself, yeah, I'm, I got problems, I'm half screwed, but you know what, at least I'm not totally screwed and I'll make the most of the things that are offered to me in life or that I have a chance at. So anyways, I love this painting too. This is by William Holman Hunt from 1851. He was another artist in the group of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And what, what that means, Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, was to go back in time to the sense of painting uh, like in the Middle Ages, before Raphael, you know, put the Mount Parnassus at the same height as the Sacrament of the Communion, meaning that they put respect for God and religion above aesthetic creation, so that the sense of purpose in the painting was more pure and noble and good, rather than just being an aesthetic exercise, okay? And so in this painting, it's the light of the world, Christ, he knocks on the door, um, but there's no handle on the outside. He doesn't open the door. The person has to open the door. And so the question is, will you answer? And, you know, it's beautiful. It's magnificent. I love the moon. Looks like a halo. It's all beautiful. So this is where all this good art comes from. So anyways, what I wanted to show you with this talk, this is the last slide here, is despite, like, I hated that book, Pax Britannia, because it was all about, you know, counting up the wealth of all their countries. And it really sucked. And, you know, I hate the Irish. Uh, and I'm saying I hate the British Empire, and it's brutality of the Irish and brutality of a lot of other peoples. But there were still people who did some good things. And it's worth learning what they had to say and what they did from the 1800s. So I thought that was worth making a talk about. And I liked that idea of the Catholic uh, Renaissance in England during the Victorian age, uh, which got you know some traction. Obviously, it didn't get as much traction as one would hope. But it did lead to some good architecture. It did lead to a lot of good literature. It did lead to a lot of good painting and a lot of Catholic converts and a lot of good behavior. Uh, I just wish it had been more successful.